All right, so I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. I don't really think I need to introduce Ron Kaplan because apparently you all know him. Um, so with that, you're on. Thank you, Mark. Um, yay! Yeah. My, first, my first heckler, at least he's applauding. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's great to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation, Mark, um, and, uh, and, your, and your team. And uh, we just figured out the last time I was in this museum, it was over at the VA, and uh, great to see it here in this uh, in this venue. And I'm glad to be here to to talk about some uh, related information. Um, I, again, I'm Ron Kaplan. I have uh, lived here in Dayton since 1995. Grew up in Columbus. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, great to see familiar faces. And, um, and that includes uh, Nancy, where's Nancy? Nancy Potts, who I worked with at the National Aviation Hall of Fame. I don't know if you all know Nancy, she's a volunteer here. Of course I know. And um, when I was uh, at the Hall of Fame, one of the jobs I had was to produce the biographical videos that would show up on stage at the enshrinement ceremonies. And we had to do four every year, and then of course all the other uh, activities related to putting on an event of that magnitude. So Nancy was instrumental because she would do the research on these biographies and put it in a coherent form so that I could then kind of turn it into a script. And then we would get uh, originally Carl Day, used to be our, our uh, video guy. And when he passed away, we were fortunate to have Nick Clooney take his place and do these videos and uh, the scripts were essential because they, they, they had to be all ready and so Nancy you know did that for a long time and I'm pleased to see now she's writing books <laughs> biographical books on uh, aviation legends from Ohio and, Thank you. Uh, well okay so um, I guess that's why we're here I, uh, this is my dad uh, I got my interest in aviation from my dad Robert Kaplan uh, he was in the Army Air Corps, uh, wanted to fly heavy bombers, I found out after he passed away. Um, he was assigned B-25s and then uh, became a pilot instructor. And so he never went overseas, he was stateside instructing pilots in B-25s and um, that's where I got my interest in aviation and World War II as a kid. Um, I gravitated to artwork uh, very early in my life such that um, I almost brought it here. I, I've got a note, still have the note from my fifth grade teacher to my parents saying, you know, Ronnie is just a happy student, but he's not doing his math. He's drawing <laughs> pictures of A. Rickenbacker's fad in the margin of his workbook. <laughs> And my parents, I remember, their reply was something to the effect that, well, it could be worse. <laughs> so that's, that gives you an idea how supportive they were. Um, but, uh, I, see, I have another one. Hopefully this works as advertised. There's an on switch on the side. Oh, you young people. <laughs> on switch. Oh, there we there. go. Uh, I love this picture because years later in my career, I got to fly a bunch in uh, T6s. That's a dad at, at advanced training. So we lived in Columbus. I grew up in Columbus, went to Whetstone High School. But growing up as a youngster, my dad was a private pilot. He was a professor at Ohio State in health education, but we flew out of Don Scott Field, and a lot of his peers and colleagues were like him, World War II veterans, and a lot of them were veteran pilots, uh, real neat folks. But we would come over here to the Air Force Museum once a year, and that was a big deal, big deal for me. Am I blocking your view? Can you all see that? Um, so found this picture of me in some, some cockpit that I've never seen uh, recently at the museum, uh, but that was fun. Um, I went on to Ohio University. I was in graphic design and communications, and um, I learned to print t-shirts in high school, and I was printing t-shirts in college, and um, short story long, I got disenchanted 
and dropped out of OU after two years in graphic design and uh, couldn't transfer to Ohio State, but moved back to Columbus and went to work in the t-shirt business. And it was at one of the companies I worked for before I started my own, 1981, I heard the Doolittle Raiders were having a reunion in Columbus. Mm -hmm. And I went to my boss and I said, I'd like to do a shirt to you know, commemorate them coming to Columbus that we can give them when they're here. And she said, well, if you get it paid for, you can go do that. So they were having a luncheon at the 94th Aero Squadron. If you've been to Columbus, it closed last summer finally, but that 94th Aero Squadron restaurant hosted a luncheon for them. And I talked to the manager and got the restaurant to pay for the t-shirts. And uh, I said, the one deal, one condition is I get to present the Doolittle Raiders these shirts. So they said, you know, knock yourself out. They didn't care. And so this was one of the many pictures I have from that day uh, outside the 94th Aero Squadron. And we're under the wing of a B-25. Mm -hmm. The owner of that restaurant chain, chain uh, David Talashay, who we'll mention later in the show, bought a B-25, and, and I think over in England, and had it flown over in time to park it there just so there would be a B-25 when the Raiders came to Columbus, which is pretty cool. Uh, now, this, mm. I had a friend of mine come with me and I had a Pentex K1000 camera, which is totally manual. Mm -hmm. And I met Jimmy Doolittle, gave him a shirt, handed my camera to my friend and said, get a picture of me and Jimmy. I said, you gotta look through there and you gotta get the focal thing just right, you know, just point it at his tie and when it matches up, take the picture. And that's the picture, it's totally blurry, focused on the back wall. The only picture of me and Jimmy Doolittle I have. <laughs> but I still Very treasure it. None at, all. at least, at least your head's not cut off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, I had the t-shirt company, my own t-shirt company from 1982 until 1994. I had a business partner and about 1990, uh, things were going smoothly and I was getting very frustrated because as an artist, I was managing business problems and employee problems and I wasn't doing artwork. And I decided I wanted to get back to painting. I hadn't had a brush in my hand oh, really since college. So I um, thought, what am I gonna paint? And uh, I went down in my uh, book collection and all boxed up and I pulled out a book I bought in college called Classy Chassis, which is about nose art. Yep. And I was looking through that book, and there's pictures of these guys, not only the nose art on the airplanes, but the jackets. And they're pinup girls. And uh, I thought, well, that's pretty cool. That, I, I got a leather jacket in the closet. And so I uh, started calling around trying to find out how you, you paint on leather and paint you know, the artwork to stay. And it was very difficult back then. This was 1990-ish. And nobody that I could find that painted jackets would tell me how they did it. It was kind of, I thought that was pretty crappy, but um, ultimately I kind of pieced it together and I painted uh, a jacket, uh, made up, I made up this nose art, and it's, that's that really, a, it's, unfortunately it's dark. There's actually lettering under dynamite that said 96 Bomb Group or something like that. Anyway, 1991, Gulf War breaks out. And I mind you, I still have the t-shirt company. Uh, this was one article that was in the dispatch that ran all over the United States. And if some of you with any Gulf War history would remember this, the, these A-10 pilots destroyed a bunch of tanks. And um, you know, notice in the background, it's the, got the shark mouth on it. That's the 23rd Tactical Fighter Wing. Their heritage dates back to the Flying Tigers, the American Volunteer Group in World War II, Flying Tigers. Um, the fact that I still have this article says something, but mm -hmm. um, I immediately, I had a jacket I was gonna paint a girl on, and I said, wait a minute. Uh, oh, wait, so the t-shirts, um, we did t-shirts for the Gulf War, and the they got in the news because um, we were donating the proceeds to the USO, and a couple of clothing chains picked up our shirts. And we did one for the Army with an Apache helicopter. We did one for the Navy with uh, a Hornet. And we did an A-10 shirt. This is not the A-10 shirt. What happened was the 23rd got a hold of me and said, we're, we're leaving England Air Force Base. We're moving to Polk. 
in North Carolina, and we want shirts to commemorate uh, before we leave here, we're having this big party, and so I designed this shirt for him, Burma to Baghdad, and, and the 23rd Tactical, Tactical Fighter Wing bought these, these shirts. In the meantime, I painted a jacket. I thought, I'm, I'm gonna do something old school with a Gulf War mm -hmm. theme. So I painted that jacket, and um, a friend of mine who uh, was a retired Navy guy, but real big in the air show business in the Midwest, he said, you know, you ought to come down to Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, I'm working the air show down there, and you ought to bring that jacket because the, uh, the, the 23rd uh, demo team, A-10 demo team is going to be there. They might, they might want to order these jackets. And I said, oh, okay, so fine. I go down there, and, and you know, I was behind the scenes, VIP kind of thing with the uh, operational side of the air show. So I was meeting all these pilots, not just them, but I met... Uh, a bunch of guys that own warbirds and fly them in air shows and um, that's the front of the jacket by the way that that's their that's their patch but that's hand painted I painted that on the front uh, and I got back to doing the girls <laughs> and that's the front of, of that jacket now these are authentic uh, squadron insignia, you know, I'm not making these up. I did make some of the nose art up uh, initially, but all the insignia are the real thing. So one of the gents I met at the Huntington Air Show, Max Marion, that's him and his BT-13. Uh, he and his buddy, who owned a T-6, mm -hmm. said, um, they didn't say they wanted jackets, they said, you want to go flying? And I go, sure. So I met him at Portsmouth not long after the Huntington Air Show, and I'm in the back seat of the T6, which was cool. Like that was the first time I got a ride in a T6, and just because my dad flew it, that was en enough. But um, they, knowing that I'm a photographer, they said let's do do some air-to-air -air photography. So this is one of the first photo photographs I ever took from one airplane to another, and I've done it a bunch of times since. But uh, that was a lot of fun. This was, and then what Max said, I want you to paint my jacket. So I wish I could show that bigger, but I used my own photo of his airplane to paint his jacket, which was pretty cool. So now at this point, Max is a walking billboard, and he's flying in air shows every weekend with that BT-13. So it resulted in in a bunch of uh, a bunch of business, uh, and then also this this is around 1991, 92. Um, the Memphis Bell movie came out, the Warner Brothers movie not the documentary. Mm -hmm. So that got everybody all psyched up, you know, about Memphis Bell, including me. I painted this. I was painting these jackets. I'd buy them on sale at a store, and then I'd paint them, and then I'd try to sell them. And, and some sold quickly, and, and some not so quickly. But uh, 1992, the Doolittle Raiders were going to have their 50th reunion. And I thought, oh, I'll paint a jacket for, in to commemorate their 50th and give it to them. And, uh, and I reached out to the Raiders and they were like, fine, you know, keep us posted. We expect you down there. And then I got I got a hold of a buddy. I, I can't remember exactly how this happened, but the, a company called Willis and Geiger makes, makes these jackets, at least back then. They've been in the business a long time. A friend of mine who was ex-Air Force knew the owner, the current owner of Willis and Geiger, and he says, send them a letter telling them what you want to do, donating it to the Raiders, and see what he says. And this is back in the days of fax. And I got a fax back from Bert Avenon's his name, and he said, Doolittles are great friends of the family, what size, what color? So he sent, uh, like a at the time, it was probably a $500 horsehide jacket. I sent two of them. So I had the jacket, and I started painting. This is this is the painting. Uh, and then the cool thing was, I said to my dad, I go, listen, I got to go down there. Why don't you go down there with me? So my dad and I made a road trip down to Columbia, South Carolina, 1992, which was really cool because he flew B-25s. Now he was younger. He he wasn't flying them. He was a teenager when the when the raid happened. So he was in 44, 45, but uh, he went down with me and uh, 
That's my dad on the left. That's Bill Bauer in the middle, one of the Doolittle Raiders from Ravenna, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And myself, we're holding up the jacket. And if you notice, the, the chalices are in the background there. This was, this was at uh, one of the events. Of, it was like a, a five-day extravaganza down there for the 50th. It was really something special. So uh, gave him the jacket. It's now in the Doolittle Military Library in Dallas, Texas. I've never been down there to see it, but um, uh, we did, um, that was April of 92. In July of 92, they were at Oshkosh. I was with the Raiders, and we had the jacket and did some PR photos. This was in Flying Magazine, uh, their coverage of Oshkosh, um, which was pretty cool. And then, uh, you know, I started getting these commissions from people who are in the Warbird business. Uh, restoring airplanes, flying them. Uh, I belong to the 8th Air Force Historical Society, Ohio chapter. And I was very active in that, and the president, Jim Erskine, was a tail gunner. And he came to me with his original jacket and a new one, and he said, here's my original. Do me a nice version with some information on it that wasn't on my original one. And you can see that's like, this is falling off of the hanger. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's the one I did for him. And uh, another gentleman who was a B-24 pilot uh, involved in the 8th Air Force Historical Society had me do this one for, for him with his mission bombs on it. And this is us at one of the Ohio conventions. That, that jacket I'm holding up is on display here. That's my personal jacket. Uh, that I painted in 1995 and then retired it because I have autographs on it, so I don't wear it anymore. Um, the Louisville Air Show, Clark County, Indiana, to be precise, in the mid-90s was amazing. The gentleman that hosted it at his airport owned a bunch of warbirds. Uh, he was in the, I think he was in the banking business down there. You have to be if you're going to own <laughs> warbirds. But he had a P-51, a Corsair, an F-86. Um, P-47. So at his air show, uh, the 357th Fighter Group had their reunion. Three of those gentlemen are up there. That's Jaeger on the left, Bud Anderson in the middle, and Pete Peterson on the right. Mm -hmm. That's a picture I took one day when they were up there. I got involved with that air show pretty heavily to the point where uh, one year I was the official photographer. But while I'm there, uh, Charles Osborne, hired me to paint three jackets for him. That was my first time painting identical jackets, and that was not fun, but I did it. Um, had his P-51 and his P-47 on it, on each of them. And, um, but that, that got me introduced to a whole bunch of people that were instrumental in the rest of my career, one of them being Lieutenant Colonel David McFarland, retired, who was running what's called the Gathering of Eagles at Maxwell Air Force Base. Uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, and if you know anything about that, it ran, it's still going on, but the, the, when he founded it, and for about the next 20 years, they would have famous aviators from all over the world come to Maxwell, and typically 16 of them each June, and take part in this week-long event, and he invited me to come take part in that, to help him run it, and in the process, enabled me to get aluminum signed, which we'll get to in a minute, autographed by many of these pilots. Um, at this time, I had this concept of doing aluminum with nose art and getting it autographed. Um, smaller pieces, that's, that's one larger piece they're signing right there. Those are two other aces from the 357 fighter group. This is down at Louisville in the mid-90s. Um, I, I had Bud Anderson sign aluminum, and the next year I was able to get this picture of him and me holding up one of the finished pieces. So that's aircraft aluminum, which I've hand painted his insignia on. And what I would do is typically six or 10 or 12 pieces, and, then, and, and they would autograph them. And then I would sell them. If someone bought one, I would finish painting it and framing it. So over the years, I accumulated these limited editions, and, and they're generally the size of, uh, you'll see on the table, nine by 10 pieces of aluminum. This is Pete Peterson's with his squadron insignia. The, the yellow and red checkerboard, if, if 
If you look at a 357 fighter group Mustang, their nose and, and the front cowling have that checkerboard. It's very distinctive to their group. So all that means something, it's all accurate. Uh, this gentleman out of Illinois owns a P-51. He had me paint his jacket with his P-51. Uh, perk of the job, in 1999, he called me up and said, hey, they're having a the gathering of Mustangs and Legends in Kissimmee, Florida. They were trying to get as many P-51 Mustangs as they could get in one place at one time down in Kissimmee, Florida. And then also people like Chuck Yeager and Bob Hoover were down there, the legends. He says, you want to go with me in the back seat? So I got to fly to, uh, we flew from Louisville to Kissimmee. Uh, I got to fly in the back seat of that P-51. Um, there's a little some detail. He wanted an action shot. I said, well, how about shooting down a Focke Wolf 190? He liked that. That's, that's the front. His aircraft is painted in the markings of this particular squadron. So 1995, uh, by then, I'd sold the t-shirt company, and now I'm a full-time aviation artist. I'm writing for some aviation publications to try to, to make money because it's the income's like this, right? And I find out about a, a Vietnam veteran in Columbus who was so mad about the Postal Service canceling the atomic bomb stamp that was supposed to come out in 1995. And, and he created a, a protest stamp. And um, I, I saw it on the news, and I went down to his office. I'm still living in Columbus at the time. And I bought a couple of sheets, and artwork was terrible, and I said so. You know, I hate to say this, but I wish I could have done this artwork for you. Uh, but anyway, I bought, bought them, and off we went. Off I went. And the next day, he calls me up, and he says, you know that news story got so many people buying these things, I sold out. I called the company to get more, and they thought they lost the scan of the original art. So if you think you can do it better and can get it to me by tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I said, you'll have it. And I, I, so I did the artwork. The, the artwork was really probably about eight inches by four inches or something like that. You know, just a, a acrylics on a, on a crescent board. And um, th this is my artwork then. We went in, we became partners. And, um, that we sold the sheets of 36. I, you can't read this, but there, there's text at the bottom that explains about the cancellation and why we created this protest stamp. And um, veterans were ordering these things from all over the place. Uh, we were in the news uh, all, all over. Uh, the 20th Air Force Association invited us, invited us to Washington and Paul Tibbetts was there and they were giving the award to the gentleman at Air Force Magazine, uh, John Carell. He was the one that found out the Smithsonian was going to put the Enola Gay on display with a whole bunch of crazy, crazy script, you know, re revisionist history. And so they were giving him an award for putting a stop to that because that, uh, I don't know if you remember that brouhaha, but I mean, they, the, the Smithsonian director, I think uh, he was forced to resign over that. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were using the sta our stamp when they were sending letters to their congressmen complaining about the Smithsonian, they would put our protest stamp, which is not, that has no postal value, next to you know their stamp. So I mean, these stamps were going all over. But we go into business and we created this first day cover, you know, an envelope, uh, and um, first day of non-issue, you know, it's not a real postmark. And then, uh, it was funny because Paul Tibbetts' brother-in-law kept coming into our office and buying stamps. And then eventually, Paul wanted to meet us. And, uh, and then we became friends with, with Paul, and then we became partners with Paul. Ooh. So the signature, so we were, we were in business. Uh, Jerry Newhouse is the gentleman's name, my partner and I. We were in business, and we were in business with, with Paul Tibbetts. And, um, and this went on for, for quite a while, a, a, good, a good year. And then I got, uh, I met my wife at the Dayton Air Show, believe it or not. <laughs> and I moved here in 1995 and got married. And so I, I, I said, Jerry, I gotta part ways with you. I did commute back for almost a year back to Columbus from Dayton. And we traveled all over the country uh, selling stuff. We had t-shirts, this is the front of the t-shirt. Uh, and then uh, I came up with this 
if, if you're familiar with the rock concert t-shirts of old, this was the, look at the last. Uh, so this was, this was kind of my detour from my aviation art. I was still doing the art. And in fact, getting to know Paul Tibbetts, um, I started doing aluminum additions with Paul. And, uh, oh, this is, this is me at the Smithsonian when we went to, uh, uh, went there for the 20th Air Force Association dinner. So, there's Paul. yeah, so there, that's a piece of aluminum polished, and then I had it clear coated, and then on it I'd paint the Enola Gay, and then he would autograph it, and that was part of a limited edition, one of my, one of my early ones, and that's what it looks like, you know, framed up. Now, Enola Gay's not too exciting of nose art, but it's as iconic as you get. Um, and, and so people who have a reverence for Paul Tibbetts, uh, you know, happy to collect such things. So in, in that conversation, if you know anything about Paul, he actually led the first mass American daylight bombing missions against uh, occupied territory uh, with the 8th Air Force. And it was only 12 B-17s. Now, he wasn't in Red Gremlin on that mission. He was in a different airplane. But the Red Gremlin was his airplane in that, uh, what was it, 96th bomb group, I think it was. Um, hideous nose art, but it's his nose art. So I said, Paul, how about we do an edition of the Red Gremlin? And he was so excited. Uh, that's, that was my prototype. And um, he, 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 was, he was more excited about that than the Enola Gay edition. So I did, um, I can't remember, I think there's like 30 of them. So this is typical. When I have these guys sign the aluminum, I take lots of pictures. Because this, to me, if you own one of these, you buy one of these from me, you get pictures from the signing, at least a picture like this. So if someone says, how do I know Paul signed it, that's as good as, he, as it gets. Um, and being a photographer, I, it's natural for me to, to do that. And that's what one looks like, uh, you know, framed up. So um, I was doing large pieces. I like to do the large ones because, you know, it kind of looks like it might have come right off the airplane. Uh, this was done for the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum Society for the, I think it was the 150th birthday of the Smithsonian. They had a big thing on the mall. That must have been about 1996. And they commissioned me to do this B-17 nose art replica for, for them. Uh, Don Gentile, yeah. Pride of Piqua. Uh, I did a big piece, you know, kind of resemble off of his Mustang. But what I was finding out, of course, that Chushu baby, which used to be in the museum, great Varga girl. So, you know, uh, Varga was the one main pinup artist and Petty was the other. And there was others, but you'll see most of mine are typically either Varga or, or, or uh, Petty. This one's being a Varga. Uh, another veteran, this guy from California, um, he saw the jacket I did for Jim Erskine for the 8th Air Force uh, Ohio chapter. He had me do his B-17 and his mission bomb. It's always fun to do the work for the veterans of World War II, and that was his squadron insignia, which was on the front. This was a, the jacket I did for myself that you saw earlier. Uh, so uh, what I want to say about those big pieces, uh, people really like the smaller ones because they said, hey, my wife won't let me put that over the top. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I started focusing more on the smaller pieces, and and as I did air shows and sold at air shows, it was hard to schlep the big pieces or ship them around and then make money uh, selling them. But the smaller pieces, you know, much easier. Uh, I did I did work for the Air and Space Magazine for their what year was that tenth anniversary issue. I painted nose art that Dan Patterson Dan Patterson then photographed, and it was the cover of the magazine. And when I went to Washington. For some trip, the editor had me come meet her in person at their offices, and she she brought up the Miss America Air Racing team, which she had a connection to at that time. And as a kid, I had one of those Cox 049 engine uh, control line yeah. Yeah. Miss Americas, 
and I've since found out I wasn't the only one that crashed it on its very first flight. <laughs> but, but I had that affinity for Miss America, you know, and I'd never been to Reno, never been to the air races, and so she connected me to the owner of the airplane and his marketing director, and I, I ended up painting a jacket uh, design for them. This is, this is one of them, and I say one of them because it became a big deal. But um, what was really cool, I had no idea. I just was doing the jacket, thrilled to be a part of the team. I went out to Oklahoma City where the plane was based, and there was an air show that the plane was taking part in, and I met the crew, and then I went to Reno for the first time in 1996, and uh, you know, just unbelievable experience being part of a race team at Reno. Uh, and then the cool thing was, they made it, they, they, they made it the, the team logo. So they started producing everything with my artwork. I have a desk model of Miss America P-51. You know, they're made over in the Philippines. And um, the base of it has my logo that some Filipino hand-painted, you know, on the base. Um, which, you know, it just blew my mind. And then uh, I show up like 1997 or 98. I show up to the races. Oh, this, so that we actually sold limited edition jackets. Now we said there's 30 in the edition. I think I painted seven. But, um, and we got Willis and Geiger involved. Bert Abaddon became involved with, he supplied the jackets. And it, it was a really neat several years. So this is what, I show up one year and, and I didn't know they were going to do this. They took a picture of the jacket and blew it up and that's the back of the transporter. You know, all these race teams, you know, have the semi uh, transporter. And uh, yeah, I was super tickled. Uh, although, when you blow up my, one of my jacket art pieces that big, you see all the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Colonel McFarland again, uh, he called me up in 96 and he said, listen, can you help? <clears throat> we got a tour of, of Southeast United States Aviation Museums. And we've got Gunther Rall. Basically what it was was a, a German a Russian, a Brit, and an American, each who had won the highest medal they could, they could win. I shouldn't say it, earn. Um, Gunther Rall, Knight's Cross, I don't know how many, you know, Knight's Cross. Uh, he had, what did he have? He had an ungodly amount of air victories in World War II, 275, something like that. Uh, Gunther Rall, um, Bill Reed, Victoria Cross, in uh, Lancaster bombers, mm -hmm. uh, Popkov, General Popkov from Russia, uh, an ace, uh, and then he he was like a MiG test pilot or something. But when the jets came on, and then um, Bill Lawley, American Medal of Honor, uh, B-17 pilot. So we we were touring them through all let's say you know, Sun and Fun and Eglin and uh, Warner Robins Museum. Um, this is in Virginia, where we had uh, had them at the Smithsonian. And we were staying at Air Vice Marshal Ron Dick's house. And I don't know if you know the name, but uh, he was the liaison for England to the United States Air Force for many, many years. Lived in Virginia, and uh, we, we stayed at his house, and I had Gunther Rall sign some panels. Um, you'll note his left thumb is missing. I just point this out for those who are into World War II history. Um, it was shot off mm -hmm. in aerial combat, and they, they think it was either Hub Zemke or one of Zemke's pilots. I mean, they, they got it all figured out, you know, uh, almost to the moment. But because his thumb was shot off at that point in the war, he probably survived because uh, he, he, he couldn't fly, and then the war ended. Because um, he'd been shot down three or four times least. Anyway, neat, great gentleman. I mean, just super neat guy. So this this is the panels back then. I painted a little further along than I normally do, and he signed it. And then this is what it looked like when it's all finished. Um, which is so I, I I did get some Luftwaffe guys along the way, but most of what most of who I was getting were American aces. I just got I have a fascination with that. They're knights of the sky, and we're not going to see aces again probably. You know ever. Um, so, for instance, uh, I would go to the American Fighter Aces Association conventions 
and in advance I would have arranged for these gentlemen to sign aluminum. This is Fred Christensen, who was one of the top P-47 aces, I think 21 and a half victories, in, uh, that's a lot, in P-47s. Um, and there, there he is, that's a famous photo of him in uh, World War II. And then this is what his finished panel looks like with his squadron insignia on it uh, in the frame. So I think his was an addition of 10 or 12. So again, I don't, they're autographed, they're stored away. You, you call me up, you say you want one of these Fred Christensen's, I tell you, well, okay, three of them were already sold. These are the numbers that are left. Which number do you want? Because if it's numbered, number five of 10, and I'll, I'll paint it, number it, frame it, and then uh, you, know, you, get a, you get a picture of the signing uh, with it as the provenance, if you will. And uh, uh, this is great, great, great picture here. So on the left, far left is Johnny Allison. Next to him, the tall, taller guy, that's Tex Hill. Uh, I don't readily know the other two gentlemen, but both John Allison and Tex Hill have signed multiple editions as part of uh, what I've done, as have other Flying Tigers and 23rd Fighter Group aces, including, that's Bob Scott, Robert Scott, who wrote God is My Co-Pilot. And I did two, two different aluminum editions with him. This one here that he just finished signing, um, it's hard to see from here, but it says God is my co-pilot. And it's interesting because I've met a lot of air show pilots my age who said they wanted to be a pilot because they read God is my, my co-pilot when they were a kid. You know, it's kind of, wow. the, other, the other fun thing is as I was in his office and he has a picture on his wall of that airplane I just showed you being painted by whoever did it back then. And I said, oh, man, can I have that picture? And he goes, oh, I don't know if I have a copy of it, but I'll, I'll see. And then he laughs. I go, what are you laughing at? He says, who would have thought all these years later anyone would give a rat's patootie about, you know, <laughs> painting this stuff? You know, he just thought it was just the silliest yeah. thing. And it just, I, I didn't even think of it until then. But, um, you know, that, that was just something that was on the airplane. Uh, speaking of Bill Lawley, that's, that's Bill, the Medal of Honor recipient, P-17 pilot. Um, not a great picture, unfortunately, the photographer cropped uh, that, but that's that's what his looks like when it's completed. That's his, um, that doesn't matter, 306 bomb squadron, that's his squadron's insignia. Uh, I only have one wasp, unfortunately, but she's pretty darn significant. This is Dora Strother, and what is she? She signed an edition of aluminum, but that's a one-of-a-kind piece. That's actual B-29 uh, engine cow, uh, cow flap off a B-29 engine. Um, you might know the story. You know your wasp story. Paul Tibbetts was brought in because the B-29 was having a lot of problems, and the airmen were scared to fly it. I mean, totally frightened. They didn't want to fly this thing. So they got Tibbetts, they said, you gotta, you gotta figure out a way to fix this. So he goes to the Wasp, and he gets a couple of ladies and trains them how to fly the B-29. One of them was Dora. So they took off on this little tour of training bases, and they would come in and you know, buzz the place, come in and land in a B-29, and all these airmen who were lined up you know, to, to, to see the demo, see the Tibbetts pop out, boom, Boom, two women pop out, take their helmets off, and, you know, like, here we are. And, and that kind of took care of a lot of the trepidation the men had about flying the B-29. So she was one of those. So I, I got B-29 cow flap, and I didn't want to make it aluminum, so I put the olive drab and gray on it. Um, the B-29s did fly in that paint scheme briefly before then in combat in the Pacific. They were, they were all bare aluminum, but uh, she signed that. And that's Pifanella, is the <laughs> Disney designed so many of the squadron insignia and designed the Wasp insignia, uh, Pifanella. And so that's a one of a kind piece. That's actually, I, that's for sale. Uh, there's a store called Bunker 27 at the mall, and they have several pieces of my artwork in there uh, for sale. They're on display, but people can buy them. And that, that piece is in there right now. 
so this is down at the gathering of eagles at Maxwell. Robin Olds, uh, great leader, uh, legendary American fighter, pilot, warrior. So in World War II, he was an ace in P-38s and P-51s. Uh, this is the insignia of the P-51 era of his squadron. I did another edition that has the insignia they used when they were flying the P-38 uh, Lightnings. And uh, he actually designed that insignia in World War II, which is pretty cool. So he was very pickled. Um, you might recognize that F-4 from being in the Air Force Museum. That's his F-4 from Vietnam, in which he has four confirmed victories, probably many more. Um, I went to work in 1998 for the National Aviation Hall of Fame. So I was writing for Flight Journal Magazine, covering a lot of things, especially here in Dayton, one of them being the enshrinement ceremonies. And the director of the Hall of Fame at that time, uh, I would, I'd bring him the magazines once they published with my coverage of his event. And he offered me a job and I took it. That was 1998. And in 2001, this is pretty cool, uh, Olds gets inducted into the Hall of Fame. So it was, I ended up being at the Hall of Fame for 19 years. And many of these people who I already knew got inducted uh, at, uh, you know, under my watch, which was super cool. So this is uh, the gentleman on the right is uh, Bob Earthquake Titus, who was another MiG killer uh, Phantom pilot, Vietnam, and a dear friend of uh, Olds to the point where he, he served as the presenter for Olds Enshrinement. Uh, so we went out and got this picture. I just love the picture. I had to show it. Uh, I got a hold of some F4 Phantom skin and called Olds up and said, hey, I want to do an edition with your Satan's Angel insignia on it. And again, he was so tickled that I actually had F4 aluminum. I started doing that with a lot of these editions, trying to get the actual type of aluminum for the pilot that was signing. Now to look at it, I don't even remember what this, this is probably P40 skin, if I remember correctly. But the point is, once you paint it, you don't really know. But it is kind of cool. I can tell you that with a lot of my editions, and I have, I have a, a list, by the way, and there's plenty of copies if you want to take it, has a list of all the aces and pilots who have signed aluminum and if there's an asterisk, it means it's, it's the, that, that type of airplane. So if it's a Corsair Ace and there's an asterisk, it's F4U Corsair Aluminum, P38, you know. So uh, uh, he was super tickled with that. That's what one of the final, final look like. In his case, I had him sign with a white paint pen because we're signing on that dark uh, Southeast Asia camo uh, green. Um, the guy that got me the F4 aluminum in Texas calls me up. He was a, a, a broker and restorer of vintage airplanes. When I went down there to get the F4 aluminum, he had a PBY Catalina in his hangar. I mean, wedged in his hangar. I mean, it's crazy. He calls me up and he says, hey, you know, the Bush Library uh, has a TBM we just hung in the, from the ceiling. And he goes, that was my TBM that I restored for the Bush Library. Oh, they're going to have a grand opening. Would you paint two pieces of that TBM skin if I send them to you? Because I want one to give to Bush, because all his squadron mates are coming, and I'm going to have them sign it. And then I want one for me, the, the guy texting. <laughs> so he commissioned me to paint the uh, two pieces. And unfortunately, I said, get pictures. Well, he didn't get Bush holding up the picture. <laughs> But he's drinking his Budweiser and showing off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and then, interestingly, many years later, a politician here in Ohio who I will, uh, who will remain nameless, is friends with the Bush family, and he was going to visit them, and he said, would you paint two pieces like you did for the guy in Texas? Now, I didn't have TBM aluminum. I don't know. That's probably P-51 aluminum, but that is Bush's... Uh, squadron insignia. That's, so that's what the ones look like we gave the, that were given to him at the library opening. And sadly, if you see his signature, this was maybe within a year of him passing away, um, and you can hardly read his signature. But uh, the gentleman took the panels, got them signed, brought them back. I painted them, framed them, you know, and, and uh, 
That's cool. So just again, if there's any Navy people here, I got Marine Corps, Navy Aces, not just Air Corps. This is Archie Donahue, uh, VMF 451, Corsair Ace. That's Corsair Aluminum. Uh, so I'm probably oh, way, oh my God. You're doing fine. Uh, <laughs> so that's Jaeger in the glamorous Glennis as it looked when he broke the sound barrier, not the one they painted up a year later. There's a, the, the, the difference there. So um, I met Jaeger at the gathering of Eagles, and I, I also met him first, I guess, at the, the Louisville air shows when we signed the uh, sign aluminum. And of course, I had the fear of God put in me, you know, about Jaeger, you know, being gruff and tough and, you know, ornery and all that. And I got to know him. We got along fine. So um, he doesn't look like he's fine, but he's actually happy there. And, uh, <laughs> I did a prototype uh, and I, I, to show him and, and said, if I did like 50 pieces of aluminum, would you sign them? And it'll be an addition of 50. And at this time, compensation. A lot of these aces were just happy to sign anything. Um, some of them wanted some money, and that was fine. In the case of Jaeger and uh, Bud Anderson with the 357 stuff, they, I, I uh, had to donate to the 357 Fighter Group Association. A lot of these veterans have their own group associations, you know, happy to do that. So Jaeger and I, it was a handshake deal, no contract. Uh, so I went down to Wilmington, Ohio, and had a guy that was scrapping out the jet engines uh, cowling down there and had him cut up a bunch of pieces and I paint them orange and I had Jaeger sign them. So I don't know what they're off of. They're off all kind of different jets, but the thing is it kind of looks sort of like, like the X1. And that's what one looks like when it's, when it's finished. So we had lots of conversations about how that is the the, no, the nose art from the original, not the one that was painted later. Um, and I'm not going to go into all that detail. But in the, in the course of doing this, uh, the 50th anniversary was coming up. And because I'd been doing these limited edition jackets, uh, Colonel McFarland said, why don't you propose to Chuck doing limited edition to commemorate the 50th? He autographs them you know, when they're done. People order them, you paint them, he autographs them, ship them off. So um, we entered into this agreement where I was going to do as many as 50 jackets in the edition. Now I designed about eight different layouts because the last thing I wanted to do was the X1 50 times over exactly, you know. Uh, now that said, there were, they always seemed to pick the one view of the X1 that, you know, the, the same. But So this was one of the jackets. That was a different design. Uh, yet another design, just changing up a little bit. And then um, Jaeger says, you got to paint me a jacket with my name on it. So this was the, the, on the front of the jacket I painted for. At the time, I was a member of the Air Force Art Program. So what you do as an artist in that program is you donate art to the Air Force. And they display it. And as part of that, the artist gets to go on a mission. And I had friends in this, the real artists that do paintings and stuff that were part of this program. And they go all over the world flying in all kinds of airplanes. And um, I thought that's pretty cool. But they never had a jacket. No one had ever done a jacket. So I was the first one to do this jacket. And the cool thing was, so Jaeger wore it on the 50th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier out at Edwards Air Force Base. And when he broke it, the sound barrier again in an F-15 painted as glamorous glass, and this is me and him the morning he's going to do that. Now, he couldn't wear the jacket in the F-15 to break the sound barrier. That's, the, that, you know, you have to have the Nomex fire suit and the G suit and all that on. But we did all this photography out there before he took the jacket off and then, and then flew uh, that mission. You see, I'm wearing one of my Miss America jackets. And... Uh, and all kinds of photos were taken. They showed up in Japanese magazines all over the world. Uh, this was a big, big deal. That open house at Edwards, there was like 100,000 people there. Um, 
it was it was pretty cool. I took this picture of him. So I had a booth in that hangar selling my artwork that whole weekend. And the Air Force had a replica X-1 that they, they hung from the ceiling. And uh, that was a press conference he gave after uh, breaking the sound barrier. So uh, then I, I got a hold of some P-39 aluminum. The 357 fighter group trained in P-39s stateside before they went to Europe and flew uh, P-51s. That's the significance there. Uh, but I got Jaeger and Anderson to co-sign a new edition of their 363rd Fighter Squadron insignia. So you see the two signatures? So that's a whole new standalone edition that they did. Uh, in 1997, I, uh, re I reached out to Bob Morgan of the Memphis Bell and did big piece, did small pieces, ended up sharing his tent at the Andrews Air Show and the Nellis Air Show in 1997. And this airman just bought one of my big pieces and had uh, Morgan autograph it. Uh, this is Bob signing the edition with just his signature. Then I was able to get B-17F aluminum. The Memphis Bell was an F model. Mm -hmm. And with that, that, so that's just the, I don't even know what, that might be Cessna aluminum, that first edition, but um, this is the crew of the Memphis Bell, as the surviving crew in 1998, signing pieces of the B-17F aluminum. In the bottom right, that guy's looking at a large piece, which is right here, and that one's for me. Uh, I, had, I, did, I did a big Memphis Bell and had them all sign it for my own collection. And uh, this is me in the process of painting one of those F panel pieces, and then that, that's how it looks. And there's one here, as a matter of fact, on display too, you can look at later. Uh, so it's got the signatures of the, the Bob Morgan and the co-pilot and three of the crew uh, at, in 1998. And that's the piece I have here. So that got me, I got involved with the Memphis Bell in a big way. The Memphis Bell Memorial Association, the bell being in Memphis at that time, the airplane, had me do stamp art because of my atomic bomb stamp. And uh, they sold these stamps as a fundraiser for the association. And Dave Talashe, that's Dave on the right, who owns, who at, at the time owned the whole chain of the 94th Aero Squadron restaurants and all those across the country. But his B-17 was in the movie The Memphis Bell as the Memphis Bell. Now he himself was a, a pilot in the 100th Bomb Group, uh, by the way. But uh, Dave calls me up in 1999, and now I'm working at the National Aviation Hall of Fame. And he says, hey, I, my airplane that was in the movie had to be repainted, the paint wore off. Got it repainted. I understand you're the guy to paint the nose art back on. And I said, oh, I, you know, who said that? So people in Memphis said, Kaplan's the guy. Memphis Bell, I got a call. So I want to hire you to paint the nose art back on. I said, well, I got a full-time job. And he said, yeah, but I want you to paint the nose art back on. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. I've never painted nose art on a B-17 before. He said, well, this will be your first. I said, well, I got a job. And he said, well, you can take time off, can't you? And I said, I, I don't even know how long it'll take. I said, I'm sorry. And, uh, hung up. So about four days later, he calls up. He says, I need you to paint that nose art on the piece of <laughs> So I went to my boss, Mike Jackson, and I said, you know, can I take this time off? I, I think I can, I could do this in two long weekends. So I take like a, a Friday and another Friday off, two weeks apart. He says, fine. So I, you know, I set about trying to figure out how I'm going to do this. Of course, I had to negotiate with Dave Talashe, and I, I thought I was told he's a real cheapskate. And um, I gave him a price, and he was like, fine. I'll fly it. I'll fly it to New York, put you up. It's, a, it's at Floyd Bennett Field. It's in a hangar at Floyd Bennett That's Field. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, which was pretty cool because my dad's from Brooklyn, where Floyd Bennett Field is. And I'd never been to where my dad grew up. So that was going to be a little extra bonus. So uh, off I went. Um, this is 
his airplane in, in this hangar, and you can't really tell from this picture, but this hangar needed to be torn down 20 years ago. <laughs> it, and the birds were pooping on the airplane and the people in the hangar, and, and, and the, it was le leaked like a sieve, you know, just dank and dark, and of course, this I'm there, it was May, and it was terrible weather. Uh, well, there was one day we could open the hangar doors out of the six days I was working on this. Uh, I had to do both sides. He wanted me to paint everything. I said, I'll do the nose art. He wanted me to paint the star, you know, the star, the serial numbers, all that. I got I, that. I don't do that. So um, this is a work in progress, the, the right side. And um, there's me on the scaffolding, working on the left, on the port side. Yeah, port side, blue. That's that's finished. Now I didn't paint the uh, bombardier's name on there. A guy named Gary Velasco was hired and did the whole the whole rest of it, and, which was kind of funny because then he was written up in a magazine as saying, "I painted the Memphis Bell." <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> um, I get a call to paint the Memphis Bell on a B1 at Warner Robins. And by that time, this is a couple couple years later, I could not. I, I that was impossible. I just couldn't do it. So an artist named Drew Blair painted the Memphis Bell nose art on a B1, and they took this air-to-air -air shot of Palisades with my nose art, my Memphis Bell on it. So I, I just think that's pretty cool. I sure wish I could have painted that B1. So um, I'm jumping to the jackets. Back to the jackets now. So. Looking at J, JT, you know, uh, a lot of people have asked how you paint jackets, and I happily share how I do it. And if they want to do it that way, you know, good on them. I love seeing painted jackets. And I remember what a challenge it was when I was trying to figure out how to do it and, you know, had trial and error and, and all that. So um, the, I have a masonite board slid up in the jacket because the front of the jacket has a zipper and stuff, and, th and this will come through the back as you're, you're painting and stuff. So there's a masonite board slid up in the jacket, and I have templates, which I, you don't see, but imagine, if you will, templates like stencils with the bombs. And um, you can see I got chalk marks kind of like get the center point and all that. And um, I stripped the dye and the oil off the jacket inside those white lines of those bombs with lacquer thinner and Q-tips. You have to get the, the dye and the oil off where you're going to put the paint down. And then I put white paint down. And this, now I'm jumping ahead a little bit. The bombs are done. The girl, there was, there was white paint for the girl. Now I've got color going down. You can see the Memphis Bell script outline. Now I've got the white down on that. And then the girl still needs some uh, uh, finishing detail. And that's, that's the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> the jacket. That's gorgeous. To give you an idea. Why is the one on the other side uh, wearing red? There's, to this day, differing stories, and Robert Morgan gave two different versions. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I still, to this day, I don't know. Got JT? Acrylic Royal. Oh, acrylic. Yeah. I, yeah, so it's acrylic. I've always painted in acrylic, and the only reason really is because. Um, I, you know, I paint in the basement, always had a basement studio, and you know, the oils stink up the house. But the other thing is oil, oils on a jacket are not a good, uh, good match, you know, and, and yes, they, they take longer to dry, which allows the artist to do more blending and stuff, but then they also take forever to dry. Um, and then the acrylic is pliable, and what I tell people, you know, it'll crack, there may be a chip around the edge because you know when you're when you're taking that oil and dye off up to the edge of what you're painting, you can't be super super exact. But but by and large, uh, you know it'll crack with the leather. But actually, that kind of gives it the you know the looking patina, out, right? Yeah, patina. Uh, jumping into some of the famous people uh, that you might not think of that I've done uh, panels with. That's Ted Williams. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Nancy, there's uh, General McGee. Yeah. There's Charles. Yeah. <laughs> That's Steve Pisanos. 
uh, he was the best man at, in Gentile's wedding and vice versa. They flew together in the same squadron in uh, the fourth fighter group, Boxing Eagles. Bob Hoover, you know, he flew in the Mediterranean, was shot down, was a POW. Uh, he was flying Spitfires, an American unit flying Spitfires. And then uh, famous story is he stole a Focke Wolf 190 to escape. Uh, that's a, that's a whole other story. I noticed here he got a Curry he exhibit. And, uh, you know, here in Xenia, we had Pee Wee Martin, who was uh, one, one, with the G Company, uh, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, G Company. Not easy, easy Company, E Company, he was in G Company. And that's their uh, 506 insignia on a piece of aluminum. He, he sadly since passed away, but he, he made it to 102. And then I've done a lot of unique commissions. Uh, someone on the base, I don't remember his name, but he this is a he wanted something to look like it was paint cut out of a, a you know early right field aircraft fabric. That's actually Waco glider fabric that I happen to have from another project. And I roughed it up and made it, you know, try to make it look even older than it, than it was. But that was pretty cool. I, I wouldn't mind doing another one of those. That was, that was fun. This was a piece I did for Flyboys, the, one, the restaurant that used to be over at the mall. Uh, same thing. It was a World War I uh, insignia on fabric. So I, I have some collectors of my work. I have four or five people who collect multiple pieces of my work, and one gentleman here in Beaver Creek had me going on the museum collection. So this was the piece. Now, I prefer to do the girls as close to the way they look in the pinup, not like they really were painted by some amateur or you know crew airman, crew chief. So you'll notice a, here, a whole lot, notice her detail, and then notice mine, which is what, you know, we, we talk this through when I'm working with a patron. This is all, not no surprise to anybody. Um, this was another piece he had me do. You know, I've done it before, the Shushu baby. Uh, this gentleman found me through uh, the 100 Bomb Group Foundation. His dad flew this airplane. Uh, he had some pictures of the nose art. And then I had to kind of extrapolate because there were, you know, faded old pictures taken at an angle. And uh, we also kind of had to guess at the lettering color. Nobody really remembered if it was yellow or white or whatever. We believe it was probably yellow. And, uh, and again, the, the Varga girl, I did as she looked in the pinup, not on the crude artwork. And then not all were, were pinup girls. Uh, this was a real B-17 uh, nose art. And uh, one of my collectors in Florida had me uh, do that one. And that's on B-17 aluminum, which I was able to get from the folks at Urbana where they're restoring mm -hmm. the B-17. And this is one of my latest jacket commissions. Odd that, two things. Number one, that's a, what do you call it, B-3? The, uh, it's the fur line jacket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not going to wear that on Tinian in the Pacific. No way. Okay, so that's weird enough, but the patron lives in St. Augustine, Florida. So he's not going to wear the jacket either. No, no, no. It's like, okay. But that was fun, having done all the work with Paul Tibbetts to finally do something with, uh, with Foxconn. Yeah. Um, so along the way, people said, gosh, these, these limited editions are great. They're like $900, $1,200, you know, for one of these frame pieces. So I can't afford that, but we love your art. Can you do something, you know, we can afford? And um, I got, somehow I got struck with the idea of co ceramic coasters years ago. And so I started doing the research, and long story short, uh, I'm now producing these, and I, I'm trying to get museum gift shops, like the Air Force Museum, to carry them. And it's, I don't understand, I gotta crack the code. I got some code I gotta crack. Anyway, um, I've got sets of them, and their theme. So this is Marine Corps Corsair Squadrons of World War II. I just picked out the four I like. You might, uh, that VM, that 214, that's a black sheet. Mm -hmm. If you remember Bob Bob Black mm -hmm. Sheet. Uh, these are some of my favorite B-17 squadron insignia. So I did this set of four. 
uh, all of them from the 8th Air Force uh, B-17 units. And, you know, you'll notice the upper right, that black dog head, that was uh, Bill Lawley's um, squadron. You know, they, they all mean something, believe me. Um, the 100th Bomb Group, if you're watching Masters of the Air on Apple TV, that's about the 100th Bomb Group. Those are their four insignia of the Bomb Group. And this, this is a deal I have with the 100th Bond Group Foundation, and they get a portion. Uh, I, I kick them back some proceeds from every one of these that are sold, and they sell them through their PX uh, online. This is a set I haven't put into production yet, but it's basically the Memphis Bell set, 91st Bond Group. Uh, and then I take pictures of, of Warbird noses everywhere I go on, at air shows. I lay down on the ground and I take these nose pictures. I, I've just been doing it for years and years. And I was looking at them going, shoot, these might make a nice coaster set. And dang, if these aren't like the most popular. Uh, and I, I can do these all day. I've got a set of Navy fighters I haven't produced yet. And I've got air racers from Reno. You know, same, same idea, colorful under the nose. And, I, you know, uh, so I'm hopeful to get this going. Oh, so got my mission for the Air Force Art Program. November of 2001, uh, I, I, what happened was we were doing a fundraiser in Phoenix for the Hall of Fame. And we had a VIP event at a real nice home of some of our members that, that hosted it out there. And one of the guests was a general, Air Force general. And we were just talking after the party he, his wife and I and him and he and uh, he mentioned something about the art program. I said, oh, I'm a member of that. And he goes, oh, how so? Because he knew me as the development director for the Hall of Fame. And I told him what I do, and I told him about the jacket. He says, did you ever get a mission? Because he, you know, he knew how the deal worked. I said, no, I never did. And he goes, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> I, don't, I honest to this, I just, I want to fly in an F-16. And he looked at his wife and they laughed. And he goes, we can make that happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm the base commander at Luke. I'm in charge of training all the F-16 pilots in the Air Force. So uh, November of 2001, not long after 9-11, I mean, we, we had this plan, and then 9-11 happened. And I thought, well, that's going to tank this trip. Yeah. Nope. Came out there, and uh, uh, I said, what else do you want to do? I, I wanted to see A-10s on the gunnery range. So they, they took me down to Gila Bend, and they put me up in one of these old World War II scoring towers. Yeah. And I got to see A-10s coming like 200 feet from me, you know, with 30 millimeters ripping at the targets and all that. But um, got this, you know, morning training, egress and safety and all this stuff, how to, how to fight Gs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the afternoon, we go up for an hour and 15 minutes in this F-16. And... Um, Wearing the G suit, doing the exercises and all that, doesn't matter uh, a spit. We we pulled 9.1 Gs and I was out like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they got it all on video. <laughs> oh, but uh, but that was a blast. You can't tell from looking at me there, but man, I came close to losing it, uh, really close. But uh, you know what a blast. So uh, one of the neat things I got four boys and. Having grown up with their dad doing this stuff, I've got to take them to a lot of places and they meet a lot of people. And that's one of the most coolest things now. My youngest just turned 21. Mm. And these guys have a great respect for their grandpa, who they knew, thankfully, and then the people they have met. And now looking back, that's like means more to me than anything. I, I, I as a kid growing up, as you saw from the early pictures, it's been crazy to be hanging out with guys I read about, you know, in my little paperback books I would buy with my allowance and build the models and hang them from the ceiling, you know, of, of Bud Anderson's Old Crow and planes like that and get to know these guys. But um, I put this picture up here. This is from 2013. That's General Pat Brady, Medal of Honor recipient, dust off pilot, Vietnam helicopter pilot. He was inducted that year. He signed copies of his book for my two boys. That little blonde haired kid on the right is six foot three <laughs> and just turned 21. But if you look in the back there, the guy in the bow tie looks kind of familiar. Where is he? There he is. Bob Potts. 
And, and I think Nancy's probably just blocked by my son's <laughs> head there. So I found that picture. I just, but I, I thought that was a good representative shot of uh, uh, young people uh, getting to meet these heroes and understand what what they did, you know, and the inspiration they provide and the example uh, they serve as. Because the kids don't learn about any of this in school, as we know. We homeschooled our kids, so. We took care of that. In fact, I was telling Mark, uh, Mark, it probably was about that time we came to visit you, and the museum had this trunk that you could borrow, schools could borrow, and it was full of uh, uh, well, well curated educational material about military, American military history, and uh, we took advantage of that uh, years ago. So, anyway. Uh, Back to my original point, I just feel so privileged to have met these people, but then as to use my creative talents to memorialize, um, you know, their service. Like I said, that I, I keep saying that this means something. I mean, you show show this to somebody who served in this squadron, and and there could and actually a lot of these insignia are still used today. The hundredth bomb group is is the 100th Air Refueling Wing now at Milden Hall in England. And they are flying every day refueling our, our fighters and jets that are doing uh, the work for freedom. And, and they know their heritage. They actually have B-17 nose art on their KC-135. Oh, and their tail still has the square D, which is the indicative of the 100th Bomb Group B-17. So. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, happy, happy that I'm doing this. Uh, before I forget, a couple of things. I did. I have some coasters here. If anybody wants to purchase them, they're twenty-five dollars a set, and I can show you what they all look like if you want to actually touch and feel them. And then uh, I've got. I did these stickers after 9/11, and they're free. I've got a stack of them up here. If you're so inclined, uh, did those? I mentioned. I have these sheets with the list. I have over 100 of these editions that I've done. Not 100 pieces, 100 different pilots, if you will, have signed the aluminum editions. And uh, feel free to take the sheet and look, and you'll, you'll recognize a lot of these names. They're not all World War II, they're not all American, uh, but it'll give you an idea of, of, of the concept there. And, um, I think that is all I have. I'll open it for questions. Yes, I have a lot of questions. <laughs> but did you ever do the uh, 94th Fighter Interceptor Squadron? No. Mm. No. Yes, sir. You talked about the A-10s on uh, internet today. I see where the last A-10 unit DM is being deactivated, and they're going to move the airplanes to the boneyard. Yes. I saw that too. Oh, yeah, I saw that today. Yeah. Now we've heard that before. Yeah. But this sure sounds. Yeah. About fifty thousand. That's the line. last last unit that's yeah. there. Yeah. What's that? Well, my dad was working on that program in 1970, or they wanted to get rid of it, and yeah. they hadn't even built it yet. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you turn around, they they say they're getting rid of it. But then you know, I don't believe any of that. I really don't. As long as that's an efficient cost airplane. I, I don't know stay. what they have to replace it. Uh, There's 23. Nothing to replace it. Nothing to replace it. What? 23. Yeah, I, that's not going to work. I know that that's going to 35, you get, not gonna you work. get like 556 A-10s for one of those airplanes. <laughs> yeah, right. What a deal. No, yeah. I'm just saying, I read this constantly, and I can tell you all the way back to the beginning, when my dad was working on it, we're going to get rid of this, because the Air Force hated that plane. And they still pick yeah, up. Yeah, he's right about that. Any other? Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> now you got everybody all upset. <laughs> <laughs> what about that B-52 though? Huh? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, that's crazy. That, that's going to be flying in the. In they the save too. They said that's a. Uh, they say when Jesus returns, they're going to decommission the twenty forty. Yeah. Right now, I mean, who yeah. knows how much further? Right, right now, it's scheduled to be about the twenty forty. Yeah. Well, you've all been super uh, attentive and patient. No hecklers, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, 
and I'm here, so you come on over, and, and I've got originals over here and some reproduction stuff, and happy to ask, an, answer any questions after we're, we're done here. So. Well, that was a great talk. Treasure that. I appreciate well, this. Thanks very much for coming out. Yeah, yeah. Some other, some other time we'll talk about the Ohio Air and Space Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> but not tonight. Yeah. We'll let you go. All right. I appreciate everybody coming out. Remember, we live or die by your support. So tell your friends and family, and follow us on Facebook. And we hope that we'll see you back here again. And you know, if you have that military stuff just cluttering up your house. You you don't need that there. Just bring it to us. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Paul. You kind of know what I'm doing. I had no idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no breathing do you remember he had his friend, a little guy? Did you ever get to speak shoot with him? No, I would love to. Oh, okay. He had a guy and a friend that was like older than him. They, man, they were.